Kevin Paulson wants Adventists to be silent. He does not want Adventists speaking against abortion. However, Kevin Paulson openly admits right here that Adventist pioneers were not silent, but in fact wrote strong statements condemning the killing of children. But condemning abortion is, according to him, the product of, quote, Roman Catholic theology borrowed from the Greek view of the soul and body, which is very, very interesting because apparently James White, Uriah Smith, J.N. Andrews, J.H. Kellogg, Kate Lindsay, J.W. Wagner, E.J. Wagner, A.T. Jones, Horatio Lay, and other Adventist pioneers actively promoted a Roman Catholic pagan teaching. What is even more astounding is that Ellen White was surrounded by all of these voices supposedly teaching a great error, and yet amazingly, this is amazing, she remained completely silent about it. Now, stop and think about that. According to Paulson, Ellen White was an inspired prophet who was apparently surrounded by Jesuit or Catholic theological operatives teaching a dangerous pagan error, yet amazingly, she never once told them to be quiet, which can only mean two things. Number one, Ellen White was also duped and totally ignorant of this error, which would mean that Kevin Paulson is now more inspired than Ellen White. Or number two, she knew that this was wrong, yet over a period of almost 30 years, said nothing, which of course would only cast doubt and suspicion on her character and the legitimacy of her prophetic role. So let me ask you a question. Did Ellen White willfully refuse to warn the church of a terrible error, or is Kevin Paulson more inspired than Ellen White, or neither? Hello friends, in 2011, right here, the Washington Post published the article, Seventh-day Adventists and Abortion, highlighting the hypocrisy of our church. The denomination is known for its emphasis on health. Alcohol and tobacco are prohibited, and many Adventists are vegetarians. But the denomination may be the only theologically conservative Protestant group that allows, what? Elective abortions. It is very, very important to note that after the Washington Post accused the SDA Church of offering elective abortions, there was never any request for correction or retraction from the church. The SDA Church never denied that elective abortions were taking place. SDA evangelist Kevin Paulson has given the longest defense of the church's position supporting abortion. Now, I have already published a video right here specifically addressing many of Kevin Paulson's arguments. So if you haven't seen that video, please go check that out first. Kevin Paulson knows that the church is going to address or attempt to address the abortion question. So all of a sudden, he's come out making all sorts of other claims, and I'll address those in this video. Number one, rejecting Adventist hermeneutics. Adventists are Adventists because of our hermeneutic. All of our beliefs derive from the way that we read and accept the Bible. And so this is why people in our church who want to change the church will attack the hermeneutic. The authors of the Bible repeatedly and unanimously define the unborn as children, sons, babies, and as brothers. They are defined as living human children with the exact same Greek and Hebrew words for born children. And those who defend abortion are notorious for avoiding these verses. And if they have to deal with them, they will try to dismiss these as much as possible. And to do that, they reject the Adventist hermeneutic. I've already given many examples in my other videos, but I'll show you how Kevin Paulson does this. In his paper, he claimed that some have pointed to the verses about children struggling together in the womb or leaping in the womb. But in the case of Jacob and Esau struggling inside Rebekah, this was merely a what? A symbol used by God to represent the conflict between the nations which would spring from her two sons. Verse 23. This is very false and dishonest because verse 21 and 22 is a historical narrative of physical events. Isaac pleaded, she was barren, she conceived, the children struggled within her. The word for children is banim, same word used repeatedly by Moses for sons and daughters. Since I've already gone into great detail on this point in the other video, I'm not going to repeat it here, but what Paulson does is he avoids this and instead points to verse 23, claiming that this prophecy about the future of the children's descendants somehow nullifies the physical reality that these are in fact living human children. This is very very dishonest because he's comparing a prophecy with the physical historical narrative. Even though Kevin Paulson has already been called out on this, he's now doing something new and I'm making this video and showing this to you so that you can see the great lengths 
that people will go trying to defend abortion, and in doing so, their claims become increasingly absurd. He now admits that the Old Testament identifies unborn fetuses as children, but, 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 it also uses this language regarding children decades before they were conceived. As an example, he cites this passage, of your sons that shall issue from you, which you shall beget, shall they take away, and shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. The point here is that the verses we are discussing are not they are not identifying the point at which life begins, but rather God's knowledge of the future. This is very false because number one, Genesis 25, 22 was cited specifically as evidence of the humanity of the unborn, not when that child's life began. However, number two, verse 21, the Hebrew text does state right here that she did what? She conceived. What did she conceive? Children. Moses, under inspiration when writing this narrative, was not confused used the exact same Hebrew word used to describe the unborn as children from their conception is the exact same word for born children. They are all children. Number three, the authors of the Bible never assigned a different status to the unborn depending upon the age of gestation. Throughout the entire nine month period from conception to birth, they are consistently referred to as whole, complete, living human children. If there were even one text in the Bible that stated otherwise, the people in our church who support abortion would be yelling that from the rooftops, but they say nothing because they have nothing. And number four, Paulson is so desperate to defend abortion that he attempts to use the literary type of prophecy to deny and undermine the literary type of historical narrative. According to Paulson, any historical reference to children or sons in the womb cannot really mean children or sons because these are also found in prophecy. Now, to my knowledge, I've never heard of any Adventist anywhere making this claim, but let's suppose that this were true. If this were true, then the objects used in a prophecy negate the existence of the actual objects, which would mean that any biblical reference to sun, moon, stars, women, animals, etc. are all unreliable and no narrative in scripture can be accepted to mean anything. For example, if we applied Paulson's argument and we find that there is a flood in the prophecy in Revelation chapter 12, therefore, any reference to a flood in historical narrative could not be taken literally. Well, please tell that to Noah. Daniel chapter 2, the image has feet of iron and clay, according to Paulson, because this is prophetic, therefore, any reference to feet in historical narrative would not be reliable, which means the whole story of washing the disciples' feet doesn't really mean that, and as you can see, this becomes becomes increasingly ridiculous. There is no nice way to say this. Not only is this a rejection of the Adventist hermeneutic, it is absurd, and if accepted, would only undermine everything else in scripture. But what's even worse is that Paulson admits right here this prophecy. Out of his own mouth, in the very same breath, he himself undermines the very claim that he's making. In all seriousness, if you were a theology student in an undergraduate exegesis class, you would be marked down on your exam and you would fail the course for these types of statements. And what is even worse than that is that many people several different times have called Kevin's attention to this error, but of course he completely ignores that. One of the most common tactics by people inside our church on abortion is to publish a huge volume of nonsense and when called out, just ignore it and move to some other point and par for the course, he does exactly that. It's one thing to unintentionally make false statements. We We've all done that before and we don't expect everyone to understand literary types in scripture, but Kevin Paulson has zero excuse. He has a bachelor's in theology, a master's in systematic theology, and an MDiv from Andrews. He knows exactly what he is doing. Another false claim, God has never seen fit to inspire any of his chosen messengers to speak concerning this topic. Abortion is the destruction of the unborn. The Bible defines the unborn as living human children and are therefore protected by the sixth commandment. But because Paulson has denied the reality of children, he now conveniently claims that the Bible is silent. One text from the law code, however, is a huge problem and that's Exodus 21, 22 to 25. And since I've already made an 
entire video on that. I'm not going to repeat that here. However, because he has no way to address the Hebrew text, he says, this involves a woman suffering an assault by which her pregnancy is involuntarily terminated. This is not a woman agonizing over what to do about her pregnancy, but rather a physical attack upon her which ends her pregnancy against her will. If you are playing with a gun and accidentally shoot someone, you will get punished for the accidental shooting. But according to Paulson, if however you pick up the gun and deliberately shoot someone, then we should just call that freedom of conscience. That's not even worthy of a response. The sin of sexual immorality from which the abortion dilemma what most often arises and in a recent podcast right here he said this yes, Christians can preach the biblical message of human sexuality which forbids sexual intimacy outside of marriage the great majority of abortions result from sexual intimacy outside of marriage. That is completely false. Published right here in the Lancet Journal. This is free. It's open for anyone to read. Abortion incidents between 1990 and 2014. 73% of abortions were obtained by who? By married women, compared with only 27% obtained by unmarried women. The great majority of abortions are not the result of sexual immorality, but of sexual morality by married women. Doug Yowell gives an excellent response. Kevin Paulson, you argue that abortion is not a sin, so therefore it naturally follows that overcoming the sin that most often leads to abortion has no effect on the abortion act itself. If everyone were to have only proper sexual relationships, it would still not make abortion any less of a moral option. Married people still opt for abortions, and according to your evaluation of the unborn, killing them would be biblically permissible because they were not yet human. By your argument, a married couple could legitimately produce 10 children and biblically abort all 10. Where's the sin that would be avoided by being married? That is an excellent question, but notice again, Paulson will not respond. He just keeps repeating the false claims. There were no laws against abortion in the United States prior to the 1820s. That's not true. Abortion was a crime by common law and was prosecuted as a crime going as far back as the 13th century. In the USA, cases like Regina versus Webb in 1602, a woman was indicted for self-induced abortion. This this was a crime at common law at the very time settlement of the American colonies was about to begin. Conservative Protestants were very ambivalent on the abortion issue throughout much of the what? The 20th century. Do you see what he is doing? He starts from the 1820s and goes backward and then skips to the 20th century and goes forward. He's completely bypassing the 19th century anti-abortion movement and legislation because this was overwhelmingly agitated and passed by Protestants. The Catholic Church largely remained silent on abortion in the 19th century in the United States. In fact, one strand of anti-abortion rhetoric expressed a strong anti-Catholic feeling. The Catholics generally were not involved in legislative efforts to craft legal prohibitions of abortion. In fact, Catholics were objects of curiosity or even hostility. One can trace the role of anti-Catholic prejudice in discussions of abortion to 18th century England. There is a certain irony to this pattern given the current pervasive appeals to anti-Catholic prejudice by those who would legalize abortion. The anti-abortion efforts of the 19th century were almost entirely Protestant, but Kevin Paulson makes one false statement after another, trying to obscure this as much as possible because these historical facts refute all of his claims. Here's another one. Regarding 19th century American attitudes towards abortion, perhaps you should read Richard Shankman's book, Legends, Lies, and Cherished Myths of Abortion History, in which he has documented how American opinion regarding abortion was by no means unanimous during the time period of which we speak. During the 1890s, remember this name, it was Shankman who documented that at least one in six pregnancies in the U.S. ended in an abortion, and the ratio was one in four during the 1920s. Wow, he cited what sounds like a very impressive source. First of all, he's quoting two different things opinion and frequency of abortion. Second, whenever Paulson or any Adventist cites a source to sound impressive, always go and read the source and I want to thank you, my viewers, for your donations so that I could purchase and have mailed to me Shankman's book, which I have right here. Hard numbers are difficult to come by. Well, imagine that. But one researcher has estimated and it was reported. Where does Shankman get this info? Footnote 15, look that up. He cites from Carl Degler's book, At Odds, which again, 
thanks to my viewers I have right here. And guess where Degler gets his info? Oh look, page 231, he cites from James Moore's book, Abortion in America, which of course I also have. Degler says it's on page 50, so here's page 50, here is the claim, but where does Moore get his info? Oh no, look, another footnote. Well, look that up and it says, the first of these estimates is the more frankly what? It's speculative. There is virtually no quantitative data. They should not be taken as anything more than speculative estimates. The second of these two estimates offered here also what? Also speculative. Did you see what happened? Kevin Paulson cites Shankman, who cites Degler, who cites Moore, who cites himself because he has no original sources. James Moore, of course, has been heavily criticized and discredited for publishing many other errors in his book. Kevin Paulson and James Moore and others who support abortion, they do the same thing. Make an outrageous claim and then try to bury their speculations in some endnote knowing that most people will never look it up. If you've seen my video on Winslow right here or my video dispelling the myths of abortion history, you know that the original sources that do exist, like diaries from midwives and records from hospitals, have zero records of abortions of periods of up to 30 years because it was extremely rare. American opinion regarding abortion was by no means unanimous during this time period. That is completely false and outrageous, but he makes this claim in order to say abortion was controversial in Ellen White's day as it is today. Again, see my videos on dispelling the myths and on Winslow. I go into this in more detail. While the USA was divided over slavery, it was not divided at all over abortion. All states, both in the North and South, passed anti-abortion legislation unanimously with little to no resistance at all. For people inside our church who defend abortion, it is very important for them to distort and obscure this history, especially Adventist history, as much as possible. The fact that Adventist pioneers unanimously condemned abortion just like Catholics do today is anathema to them and more important that the pioneers never evolved or moved on their statements. They never softened their condemnations or made any adjustments to allow exceptions. They took a hardline stance against killing children and so defenders of abortion today do as much as possible to obscure this history and try to distract you by focusing on something else. For example, that's why there is continual focus on their interpretations of modern day politics because attention to the Hebrew text or history is fatal to their claims. Furthermore, in the 19th century, every recognizable social group in society, doctors, lawyers, clergy, journalists, feminists, and on and on opposed abortion. Only the abortionists defended it. Take a moment to listen to Kevin Paulson in this podcast and listen to what group of people he talks about. The prohibition movement of a century ago was largely a liberal social and political movement. Mm. It was championed by feminists. Wow, that is amazing. Kevin Paulson says that feminists championed the temperance movement. Let's hear some more. People need to remember that in those days, the bosses would serve alcohol to workers at the company stores, and it would get, lead them to drown their sorrows and forget their uh, grievances against uh, the corporate world that was oppressing them so badly. Mm -hmm. And femin feminists opposed the use of alcohol because men would go out and get drunk and come home and beat their wives. Isn't that amazing? Kevin Paulson constantly cites the support by feminists of the temperance movement, yet when these same feminists overwhelmingly supported anti-abortion laws, Paulson is completely silent. Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth C. Stanton, Matilda Gage, Victoria Woodhull, etc., and not just feminists, but female physicians openly condemned abortion as antenatal murder, child murder, or antenatal infanticide, which amazingly are the exact same condemnations of early Adventist pioneers. But Kevin Paulson would have us to believe this is all based on Roman Catholic pagan Greek theology. The feminists, the doctors, the judges, the lawmakers, the journalists, journalists, all the Adventist pioneers, they were all woefully deceived by this terrible error. And though Ellen White was inspired, she just was not inspired enough to see this. But lo and behold, Kevin Paulson can now see and understand what Ellen White never saw or spoke about. 
There is more that can be said, but this is enough. This video is important because as people like Kevin Paulson come out and try to persuade Adventists not to take a stand for the Sixth Commandment, their arguments are not a little wrong or partially wrong or half wrong. Their claims and statements are all false, and this is not opinion. You just put their statements next to the Hebrew text, next to the documented historical facts, and it speaks for itself. It's just one false statement after another.